Hello and welcome back to the channel. You know, judging by the comments and the messages that come in here, some of you really enjoy seeing hard luck telescope cases. For example, some of you really enjoyed me finding that decrepit Meade research grade Newtonian, that 10 inch. The optical tube was okay, but the mount sat outside for what appeared to be decades and it had deteriorated quite a bit. Scope Wizard is still working on that one. Some of you also liked the review of the 16-inch night sky structure in which we apparently displaced some squirrels by removing it from the barn and there was sort of a brown organic substance all over the mirror and it took me quite a bit of time to get that cleaned up. Well, this is the latest one. This is an 8-inch Mead Schmidt Cassegrain and you know, most of these things don't come to me directly. Some of them do, but most of these hard luck telescope cases go to a club member named Mark. And he doesn't know why he gets them either, but this happens all the time. One day he came home and this thing was just sitting on his doorstep. Just this itself, nothing else. So we have no one to thank and no one to ask where the other pieces are. This is all we got. For example, there is no tripod, there is no wedge, there is no visual back, there is no finder, and there is no hand controller. The hand controller is the one that's really hard to find because even when you do get them these days, some of them are defective. That's going to be a challenge. Okay, so what is this thing? Well, it's an 8-inch F10 schmidt cassegrain by Mead. I'm guessing somewhere around 1990. There was a period between the initial 2080, that's the 8-inch F10 schmidt cassegrain designed to compete with the Celestron C8, and the 1990s early versions of the LX200, which of course changed astronomy forever. But in between that time, early to mid-1980s to very early 1990s, Mead experimented with putting electronics in the dry bases of their schmidt cassegrains with varying degrees of success, and there was a confusion of model numbers there, including the LX3, the LX5, and the LX6. By the time you get to the LX6, right around 19, 1991, you can start to feel the LX200 right around the corner. This one is an LX5. The way you can identify this is because the original LX3, this panel here is sloped, the original LX3 had a flat vertical panel, and the LX6 had an additional set of ports here for computer control. So this one is an LX5, and for some reason, Mead never bothered to label these things. <laughs> Strange oversight. So this thing here, it's, it's, it's in pretty bad condition, and you're actually seeing it in some favorable lighting. I checked this out earlier. It actually looks a lot worse live than what you're seeing it here. The corrector plate is completely, I don't know, gummed over with some substance, and it actually gets worse because it's all over the primary as well. There's the usual dirt and debris on the drive base itself, but there also does appear to see some sort of brown organic material down there. So I just got this thing. This just came in a few hours ago. I don't even know if the drive base powers up. This thing appears to be in okay shape on the right ascension axis, but the declination appears to be almost stuck even with the clutch disengaged. So I thought we'd just find out together how this project comes along and what happens to this device. So let's take a look. You know, you might assume by the way this corrector plate looks that it didn't come with a cap, but it did. It's, it's right here, but apparently they never used it. And I've seen this happen before. They might have stored it with the tube pointed straight up and then dirt and debris just rained down on it for who knows how many years. Okay, so there are many different philosophies as to how to clean optics, and depending on who you listen to, they're either all right or they're all wrong, and they could be both. So for something this bad, we're going to try something like this. We're going to use Windex. That may seem like a crude and brute force method for doing this, but I will recall a story that somebody told me about something that happened at Astrofest in Kankakee, Illinois in the 1990s. A person with an astrophysics refractor that had a dirty lens on it went to Roland's tent and said, could you please clean my optics for me? And Roland looked at it and he said, okay, I think I know what to do. In the next few minutes, word got round that Roland was going to teach everyone how to clean their optics, and a crowd formed, and he came out, allegedly, with a bottle of Windex and a cheesecloth, and then he just cleaned it. He says, don't worry about it, the thing's fine. Hey, I'll tell you what, if it's good enough for Roland, it's good enough for me. So we can just go ahead and do this, and 
You know, I was once uh, taking a, a class by t uh, someone who was teaching us how to do bike maintenance. And what he said was, when you try to clean something like this, do your best to not scrub or rub anything for as long as possible. You want the weight of the liquid itself to do most of this take, uh, cleaning for you and that the weight of whatever this fluid is is going to carry the dirt down. Now, the other thing you may notice is that I'm spraying down by the base of the electronics here. I do that for a couple of reasons. I could have covered those things up, but you know what? I've seen enough of these old me drive bases and many of them are just defunct by now and the ones that are functioning, well, they tend not to stay that way for very long. The other thing, it's gonna be several days before I can plug anything in here, so I, it's gonna be dried out by the time I do that. One reason it is gonna take so long is the power jack on these early Meads did not have the standard 2.1 slash 5.5 millimeter 12 volt power jacks that we all know and love. Theirs had a thicker center pin. It was a 2.5 by 5.5 millimeter jack. It's frustrating, but you know, it was the 1990s. Things weren't quite standardized yet. So I'm gonna go through this a few more times and then we'll take a look at how this came out. Did this help? Well, no, not really. In fact, it didn't do anything. Amazingly, there is far more damage inside the scope than outside. So it's off the scope wizard's house. We quickly determined that the only way to clean this thing was to take it completely apart. I've never felt comfortable taking apart Schmidt Cassegrains, but in this case, there was no choice. The corrector plate is held on by six small screws. Loosen these and the plate should come right off. There's usually an orientation mark on the plate put there by the person who assembled it. But if yours doesn't have one, mark it yourself so you can put it back in the same position when you're done. Yeah, wow, that's dirty. I'm especially concerned about the condition of that secondary. That does not look good. It appears that since the visual back was left open, a critter of some kind crawled inside and made the telescope its home. In order to remove the primary mirror, you have to take out a retaining ring inside and remove the focuser from the outside. Be careful when doing this, there's a linkage on the focuser that moves the mirror. It's easy to lose that part. The back of the mirror looks fine, of course. I've often tried to decipher what all those marks are. I mean, I see them all the time. I wonder what those things signify. The front of the mirror, yikes. Whatever lived there left countless marks on the surface from scurrying around. I'm not sure how much could be done here. Both mirror surfaces look pretty bad. Amazingly, Scope Wizard had a spare LX5 hand controller in his parts bin. Here's the moment of truth. Will the mount power up? Yes, the RA buttons even move the scope correctly. Amazing. Now all that's left is to clean the mirrors, put it back together, and collimate. Okay, so it's about two weeks later, and as you can see, things have improved dramatically. You know, I told Scope Wizard, don't knock yourself out doing this. You could wind up putting a lot of time into this project, only to have us all find out that the scope was no good to begin with. He said it wasn't a big deal, but he said he did use an entire box of cotton balls just cleaning up those two mirrors. And this actually looks much better than I expected. The primary in particular came out much better than anybody thought it would come out. Secondary, a little less so, but still better than I expected. The one casualty of all of this, the corrector plate seems to have lost all of its coatings and that's not good. Well, okay, so about the drive base. You know, there was a palpable sense of disappointment when it powered up, that thing I showed you earlier, because if it stopped working, if it wasn't working at all, it would have made the decision a lot easier. But because it did power up, we could theoretically use it. You know, we asked around and nobody has any enthusiasm for putting this thing up on a wedge. Now, when you do take the optical tube off the fork arms, on most Meads Midcassegrains that I've seen, there are three screws on each side of the fork arm that you have to take off. Once you do this, the tube should just slide off. If it doesn't, there's a good chance things have just gotten stuck over time. And if that's the case, there are two screws underneath here that you can loosen. You don't have to back them off all the way, just loosen them a little bit so you can separate the fork arms and get the optical tube off. Okay, so the last step in this process is getting the Vixen-compatible rail underneath the optical tube. 
This is the part that a lot of people don't like, and I don't blame them. Especially on these early models, they never intended for you to do this. So if you can't find a plate that fits, Scope Stuff sometimes sells them, but if they're out or if you don't have a plate, sometimes you're going to have to get a little bit creative, which I did here. This is an ADM plate that I had, and the hole spacing wasn't quite enough to fit the edges here, so I had to slot the hole a little bit. By the way, this has become a pet peeve of mine, and I may do a video on pet peeves of the industry, and this is going to be one of them. Please, industry, give us standard size plates with holes pre-drilled and countersunk for all of the common hole spacings. Could you get on that, please? Yeah, thank you. Also, I want to point out that the hole spacing for Meads and Celestrons are not the same. <laughs> Meads are usually a little bit wider. Okay, so after all that, how does it perform? Well, we get our trusty dew shield out in the observing field and put it on the telescope like this, and lo and behold, it's fine. The collimation is good, the star test is good, there's very little image shift, it just looks like a typical schmidt cassegrain The one casualty of all of this that I'll point out is the corrector plate. The coatings are gone, just plain gone. <laughs> Normally, if you hold the schmidt cassegrain up to the light, you'll be able to see a dark purple or perhaps a dark green sort of reflection coming off of it. Here, you get nothing at all. In fact, the reflections are so bright coming off of this thing, it feels like in a bright room you might even be able to use it as a shaving mirror. So what effect does this have on images? Well, normally when you lose coatings, you're going to lose a little bit of contrast on bright objects like the limb of the moon. The transition between the white of the moon and the black of space should be very sharp and nothing in between. Get a little bit of a haze here. It's really not too bad. The combination of deteriorated coatings on the corrector plate as well as 35-year-old coatings mean that the images are going to be slightly dimmer. How dim are they? Well, I've got a lot of Schmidt Cassegrains around here, and I have a Celestron C6, that's a six inch Schmidt Cassegrain. It's brighter than that. However, I, ha I do have a number of other eight inch Schmidt Cassegrains around here, and it's a little bit dimmer than those. It's really not that bad. I don't know if you would really notice that had you not had them side by side. Another concern that you might have with deteriorated coatings is contrast. So I checked it out on the Veil Nebula in Cygnus. I put an O3 filter on a low power eyepiece, it looked fine to me. It's fall right now and we're looking at all of the fall objects and looking at, for example, M33, a notoriously difficult low contrast object, it shows up just fine. If I hadn't told you that this thing was essentially a telescope shaped piece of dirt a couple of months ago, I don't think you'd ever know the difference. Okay, so I should point out here that not all of these restorations go this well. In fact, from experience, I can tell you it's probably 50-50. And the reason I point this out is during the two to three months that this has been going on, I have received, coincidentally, three messages from people showing me old decrepit scopes they got for free. And in at least a couple of the cases, I had to tell them, yeah, I don't know about that one. If you want to pursue this project, try not to put a lot of money into it. Okay, so was this a perfect restoration? No, it was not. This is pretty good at low to medium power, and the real test, of course, is with imaging. I tried to do some webcam lunar planetary with it, and over the course of at least two lunar cycles, I probably went out with this thing 20 times. I tried it on Saturn, and these probably look okay at first glance if you sort of squint and look away. But if you know where to look, there are some problems here. I could never draw a fine focus on any of these things. And the really bad one here was Saturn. I could never draw a fine focus on Saturn, even visually at medium power. But, you know, I'm not complaining. This is a win in my book. Okay, so what's next for this thing? You know what? I think I might hang on to this thing for a while. I'll use it for outreach. It and I have bonded through this healing process. So there you have it, folks, a look at a restoration of a dirty 8-inch Mead Schmidt Cassegrain from the late 1980s. I hope you found this interesting. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.